Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and a very warm welcome to day two of the Air and Space Power Conference 2022. I'm Air Commodore Gretchen Fry, Director General of Strategy and Planning for the Royal Australian Air Force and your conference host. Welcome back to those who were with us yesterday and for those just joining us today, we're delighted to see you. Day two of the conference will start with a view to the heavens as we explore space power. After morning tea, we'll invite you to break out and explore the many and varied sessions of our Innovation Expo before reconvening to examine how to harness our creativity towards an adaptive culture of innovation. We have a day ahead of us that is rich with discussion on disruption, change, innovation and resilience, primarily in the context of space power. A short access to space is critical to enabling defence's multi-domain operations. In May last year, the Australian Government announced that a Defence Space Command would be established, and as Minister Dutton announced yesterday, it has commenced operations. Our keynote speaker has had first-hand experience in establishing an organisation to lead military engagement in the space domain. General John W. J. Raymond had a distinguished Air Force career across strategic and operational roles. Sir, apologies for past tense, has had a distinguished career including as Commander, US Space Command, before being appointed to the newly created United States Space Force just over two years ago as its first Chief of Space Operations. As the Royal Australian Air Force launches into our own space journey, we're privileged to host General Raymond to share his reflections on the establishment of the United States Space Force, the importance of space to militaries, and the role of innovation. We're in good hands. General Raymond will take questions at the end of his presentation. And General Ra Raymond, sir, may I now welcome you to the stage. What a, what a great day, a great evening. And I uh, can't tell you how excited that my wife Molly and I are able to be here with you. It's, uh, we've been looking forward to this for a couple years. And uh, Mel, I just want to say thanks. Thanks for being such a gracious host and, and for uh, letting us be here and, and share a few thoughts. Uh, Air Commodore Fryer, thank you for that kind introduction. And it's, it is really great to be here, the first of a kind Air and Space Power Conference. Mel, uh, besides the fact, uh, besides thanks for hosting this event, I also want to thank you for your continued partnership and friendship. It's been one of the, the two pleasures of my time in this job, is being able to, to work with my uh, fellow chiefs. Many of them are here. It's great to see you all. And uh, again, it's, it's great to be here and uh, be able to do this in person rather than on a on a Zoom call or some, uh, some kind of video, video conference. Great to be here in person and, and to be able to do it without having to have masks on. Uh, to Air Vice Marshal uh, Roberts, Catherine, uh, congratulations on being selected to lead the newly operational Defense Space uh, Command. I'll tell you, I have had the opportunity, as is, is highlighted, uh, to actually build two new organizations over the last, last three years. First, U.S. Space Command and then uh, U.S. Space Force. And I have a, a pretty good understanding of the challenges that you're going to face, but more so the opportunities that you're going to have as you build this com uh, command to, for great effect uh, for your country and for the nations around the world. You know, Australia has, has long had an important role in space. And in fact, if it weren't for Australia, those of us old enough to remember 1969 uh, wouldn't have been able to watch in real time Neil Armstrong descend from the Eagle Lander and take those first steps on the lunar surface. And that's because the th the, of the three antennas that were transmitting uh, this historic broadcast back to Earth, two of them were Australian. Because of the moon's position at the time, there was no dish in the United States that could pick up that feed. So a radio antenna at Parks Observatory in New South Wales stepped in and transmitted that broadcast to 650 million people around the world who were glued to their TV sets. Among them was a seven-year-old young boy named Jay. Uh, and I remember those few minutes uh, very clearly, and they changed my life forever. I remember when my dad was in the military, we were stationed at West Point, New York, and I sat on the living room floor and, and watched, that, watched those, uh, that uh, critical event, and watched those first steps, and then immediately turned around and went to the dining room table and built an Apollo rocket. And that began my love of space. And so thanks uh, on behalf of me and all the other millions of folks that had an opportunity to see that and for being there at a crucial time. I'll tell you another uh, funny childhood story. I, uh, a few years later, I was stationed in Germany with my parents, and I had my appendix sticking out. And I was 
at home on, uh, for a couple of weeks recovering, and I had to do a report on Australia. And I did like this spectacular, spectacular report. Um, and it, it uh, solidified my love for wanting to come visit this, this great uh, country. And so I hadn't had an opportunity to come until 2012. I was stationed in Japan, and I got invited to speak uh, up, in, up by Mackay uh, at uh, Baker's Creek Memorial. It's a memorial that, was, that this little town built to commemorate um, uh, or recognize the, the uh, airmen that were killed in a World War II uh, plane crash. And I remember getting to the airport and going up to get a rental car, thinking, I've got the full day. I'm going to go explore Australia. And I pulled my, my, uh, my driver's license out and ID card, and lo and behold, my driver's license had expired. And in the United States, that's not a big deal, because as long as you're in the military, and if you have a military ID card, it, your driver's license never expires. Well, what I learned, that doesn't work in Australia. And, and so they said, well, you can go home and run a car, but you're not going to run a car here. And uh, so I, I got a chance to see the hotel room, uh, but, but I got a chance to participate in an incredible, incredible ceremony. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of, the, at the end of my talk. But it showed, it showed, it highlighted to me the valueship of partnerships uh, between nations. That partnership is alive and well in space. My point for bringing up Australia's role in the 1969 broadcast is also this, that Australia still plays, a, still plays a cru crucial role in space. Lots has changed since 1969, but the United States is located exactly where it was back then, squarely in North America. We had good visibility over a part of the globe from our vantage point in the Northern Hemisphere, but your location in the Southern Hemisphere that makes for a, a really, really great team. We each bring to the table what the other can't. We're stronger together. And our cooperation goes well beyond space. The last century proves that across all domains, our nations are stronger when we're together. I'll talk some more about our areas of mutual cooperation in space in just a few minutes. But I'm, first, I want to start off by congratulating you on your recent initiatives to prioritize space from the funding boost that the Australian uh, government has recently announced uh, in, in giving to the space sector, to the publication of the Space Power Manual, and most importantly, to celebrate with you the concrete steps that you're taking to operationalize the space domain. With the formation of your space division in January and the formal ribbon cutting of that new defense command later this morning. I want you to know that you're in good company. As we stood up Space Force just over two years ago, several of our other partners and allies around the world have also joined in elevating space uh, to the level of importance uh, for their nations. So why now? Why this recent movement to reorganize our forces to better understand and operate in space? Well, for starters, space is just cool. I always say that, I always say that back in home, hey, all the cool kids want to come this way. Uh, but that, in fact, uh, I've known that since I was seven years old. And I wish I could say, though, that that alone is what's turning our attention upwards to what's going on 100 kilometers above the Earth's surface. But the reality is more complex. First off, space has become necessary to our modern way of life, from navigation to precision timing to banking to agriculture to climate, uh, climate change mitigation, and so much more. We all make use of space assets every single day, whether you, you realize it or not. And our reliance on space is only going to continue to increase over time. But more importantly, we can no longer take space for granted. A few years ago, I wouldn't stand up here and say space and war fighting in the same sentence. Uh, but the actions of a few nations in space have made this all too clear, that space is a war fighting domain. And we can no longer operate under the illusion that our assets in space, which we rely on heavily for our security as well as for our way of life, will remain safe from potential adversary action. We no longer have the luxury of taking space for granted. If we were to lose our ability to use our space-based assets, it's not just our space operations that would be impacted. Our land, sea, and Air Force missions can't close without space. Many of you here, are, or those that are watching online from around the world, served in Iraq and Afghanistan, where US, Australian, and many other allied nations conducted operations side by side, on the ground and in the air. Space was a key enabler in most of those operations. And today, more than ever, we see the value of space in providing awareness of events around the globe from natural disasters to missile launch warnings. No matter where you are, your security in some way depends on space. 
and on our ability to access the, da access the data collected by our, our on-orbit assets and the security and effectiveness of our joint and co coalition forces depend on space. As I said earlier, we are partnering with more and more nations on the national security space front, and we deeply value our partnerships uh, uh, with those that are here in this room with us today. Perhaps the most important example of our collaboration is in the area of space situational awareness. In November 2013, we signed a memorandum of understanding that relocated the Space Surveillance Telescope from the United States to the Holt Naval Communications Station in Exmouth. After it was re reassembled in 2019, U.S. and Australian forces jointly performed operation and maintenance on the telescope. And after calibration and recalibration, some testing and evaluation in a trial period uh, that will start this July, the Space Surveillance Telescope will be operational by the end of this year. Thanks to, the, to, the, to its new location here in Australia, the telescope will have observation over the southern celestial hemisphere, adding a significant data collection capability to our coalition forces. I just want to add that I'll be visiting Exmouth tomorrow, and I couldn't be more excited to see the Space Surveillance Telescope and the folks that are, that are stationed there in Exmouth. But it's not just the SST we've worked on together. In 2014, our two nations, along with Canada and the United Kingdom, signed Com the Combined Space Operations, or CSPO, Memorandum of Understanding, to help us all get smarter on the current and future space environment and to enhance our military-to-military -military relationships in this area. Later, New Zealand, France, and Germany also joined, understanding the true multilateral nature of this initiative. And after meeting late this year, this February CSPO released its Combined Space Operations Vision 2031, which outlines our overarching purpose and reiterates our guiding principles, namely keeping space free and accessible, ensuring responsible and sustainable use of space, and upholding international law. Another area of cooperation is the Advanced Extremely High Frequency, or AEHF, AEHF system, a constellation of communication satellites that provides services not just to the U.S. forces, but to Canadian, Dutch, U.K., and Australian forces. Thanks to AEHF, our combined forces, whether on the ground, sea, or in the air, can make use of vastly improved global, survivable, and protected communications capabilities. One last example is the Wideband Global SATCOM system or WGS, another strong area of cooperation between our two nations, with Canada and the Czech Republic, Denmark and Luxembourg. The Netherlands, New Zealand, and Norway are also partnering with us. WGS provides flexible, high data, long haul communications for our warfighters and is the backbone of military satellite communications. The programs I have mentioned are just the beginning. I hope to continue to strengthen our collaboration in space on many examples and many projects uh, here to come. And, and that's because we all have so much to gain, so much to gain by working together in space. When we partner with other nations who share our security interests and our basic values, we benefit in several ways. First off, we share costs. As military leaders, we must be responsible stewards of the resources our nations allocate to us. We must find ways to develop more resilient capabilities without breaking the bank. Through the commercial space sector, uh, we see a rapid expansion. You could even say it's exploding. That's a bad word to use in the space business. We are seeing more comp competitive pricing throughout the space sector. Second, we share knowledge, experience, and expertise. For example, we have two guardians embedded with, within the Royal Australian Air Force, and eight Royal Australian Air Force personnel are embedded within the Space Force. We have plans for these numbers to grow. We have similar personnel exchanges with several of our other close allies, and we value all of them. These personnel exchanges allow, us, allow our people to train together, to operate together, and build strong, lasting relationships, which enhance our force's ability to conduct real-world missions when needed. Third, and even more important, by standing together, we bolster deterrence, decreasing the chances of aggressive acts, both in space and in the other domains. Working together helps us move faster in our urgent goal to replace our legacy space architecture, which is made up of very small numbers of highly exquisite satellites, and we want to replace that with a much more resilient network, one that can withstand uh, the contested uh, environment that we face today. By doing so, we will also limit the, eliminate the first mover advantage that a potential adversary may have if they were to take, take actions first. 
Our cooperation and collaboration enhance the security, stability, and sustainability of the domain and therefore of the world. And now I'd like to offer a few uh, reflections on our own stand-up. You know, just over two years ago, uh, on the 20th of December 2019, the United States uh, established this new, this new force, new service, the first time we've had a new service uh, since the Air Force was created uh, in 1947, separating from the, uh, from the Army. And I hope that some of the thoughts that I, that I share might be of some value to you as you think through and, and begin building this new Space Command. The Space Force is an independent service, just like the Army, Navy, Marine Corps, and Air Force. And similar to the Marine Corps, which is organized under the Department of the Navy, the Space Force also falls under the Department of the Air Force, and we remain very tightly linked to our sister service, our Air Force. Our Secretary of the Air Force, Frank Kendall, has championed this relationship with his motto of one team, one fight, and we live it each and every day. That same year in 2019, just a few months before the Space Force, we established uh, the 11th Operational uh, Combatant Command, United States Space Command, who's commanded by Jim Dickinson, who's here with us, I think, Jim, there you are. Good to see you, sir. Um, and as a joint unit, analogous to Indo-PACOM. So if you look at it, in our structure in the United States, we have uh, both services and combatant commands. Services organize, train, and equip, operate capabilities under the authorities of a combatant commander. And so we've normalized that structure across our, uh, across our uh, services and combatant command as it relates to space. As a military service, the Space Force recruits, trains, and equips guardians. These guardians operate capabilities all around the globe, again, under the authorities of U.S. Space Command. The Space Force works across the whole of government to maintain space security. And the differences I've observed between the time uh, just two years ago and now are striking. And so let me share a few things that we've done, uh, again, as precursors to things that you might be thinking through as well. As, I, as we stood up, I told our team we have two risks. The first risk is that we don't think bold enough, that we just kind of make some incremental changes. And we've been given an opportunity to build a service with a clean sheet of paper and to move out at speed and, and build a service for today, not, a, not trying to, to make incremental changes of a service that uh, is, is much older. And the second risk that we have is that when we do think bold, that uh, the bureaucracy will, will get in the way and, and keep us from being able to implement new ideas. And so uh, I would guess for my uh, Australian uh, partners, uh, if, I, if I were to give you one piece of advice, be bold uh, and, and go big. And we need, we need this uh, command and we need this command to, to help us all get to where we need to, to be in this new, uh, new war fighting, new operational domain. A few things that we have, we've made great strides on. First of all was improving the professional development of guardians. Um, We've set up our own training and education command, Star, uh, dubbed STARCOM, and space is no longer a kind of a side note of professional military education. That was one area that Congress was really pushing on us uh, when we set up a Space Force to increase that. I will tell you, Mel, in talking, having an opportunity to chat with several of your folks here over the last couple of days, uh, I want to sit down and pick your brain, because there are things that you're doing uh, in the Australian Air Force that we think would be really ripe uh, for innovation in our service, and uh, look forward to exploring that with you. We also have a much greater sense of unity of effort across the Department of Defense. Back when the Space Force was established, there was this thought there was like 65 different organizations across the Department of Defense uh, that had a role in space. 65 of them could say no, but nobody could say yes. Well, you now have a service, and with that service brings with it uh, a little bit of center of mass that allows you uh, to get some things through the building and to say yes. We have a much stronger voice in requirements as a service chief uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I have a strong voice in requirements, and we are part of the, the Joint Requirements uh, Council, the JROC, uh, which allows us to, to be a, the, the integrator for all joint space requirements. So now if, if Congress wants to yell at somebody, if, if our programs get disconnected, they've got one person to yell at, and that's me. Uh, our defense budget reflects the importance of space. And although we have, uh, if I were to share our defense budget today, my career dissipation light would be blinking because it hasn't been released yet. Uh, I will just say that uh, you'll, you'll see when it's released that, that uh, the department continues to prioritize space uh, uh, for our nation and for our allies and partners. Our space-based intelligence capabilities, which reside in several organizations across our government, are also much better coordinated. 
And finally, I think the thing that I'm most proud of by establishing an independent service, we can now reach out directly to our allies and, and work on space security together. The result is that in the past couple years, we have been changing our relationship with our international partners in space from capability development to operations and collaboration across the board with the benefits I just spoke about a few minutes ago. And we need every advantage we can get. Our pacing challenges have been extremely fast paced and we've got to move faster to stay ahead. Working with allies and partners is one way we can, do, we can accomplish that goal to stay ahead of that. The other way we're working on is to, to uh, change our acquisition processes to allow us to uh, capitalize on this new commercial industry that we've got. And let me share, you, share a story with you. Two years ago in January, I visited uh, SpaceX uh, satellite factory up in Washington State in the United States. And uh, Mr. Elon Musk was there and he took me into a factory and it was a big empty room, probably the size of this auditorium, but flat. And there was nothing in it, some tables and some smart people and a vision. And he said, Jay, I've got two satellites on orbit that I really don't like. I'm gonna redesign those satellites and then I'm gonna build this uh, factory and then I'm gonna build satellites and then I'm gonna integrate those satellites on a launch vehicle and then I'm gonna launch them. That was in January. In April, less than four months later, he redesigned satellites, built the factory, built 60 satellites, and integrated them on a launch vehicle and launched them. And today, he's got over 2,000 satellites providing global internet to the world, including in, in Ukraine. We want to be able to leverage that. And when I, when, I talk to, when I talk to innovative business folks, they say they're tired of the Department of Defense coming and, you know, uh, dropping a, a stack of requirements this big on their desk and say, build this. What we'd like to do is have a conversation and say, hey, here's our challenges that we're facing. How would you build it? And get their thoughts early. And so that's exactly what we're doing. We set up an organization called the Space Warfighting Analysis Center. They're doing all of our force design work uh, for, for our, uh, for our uh, space capabilities to be able to pivot from the architectures that we have today to a more resilient by design set of architectures. We've done all the modeling of that and then pulled industry together and handed it all to them and said, okay, here you go. Here's what we're thinking. How would you go about doing it differently and, and get, get their ideas uh, early on? We've also done that with our, our closest partners and we uh, look forward to being able to continue to share that force design work with the goal of being able to collaborate even more closely in capability development uh, in the years ahead. I hope what I have shared can be of some use as you, as you make your own path in prioritizing national security space. And I'll be happy to try to answer any questions that you have uh, in the next, uh, give me a minute or two and then I'll, I'll open it up for questions. Uh, but before I wrap it up, there's one thing that I didn't mention about my first trip to Australia and that was what I learned from it. First of all, don't let your driver's license expire. Uh, but what I really learned and what made a profound, a very profound impression on me then and has stayed with me ever since. When I watched the parade, there was a the town put on a parade at this Baker's Creek Memorial. Again, that they built on their own to recognize uh, U.S. airmen that were killed uh, in, in, during World War II. And I watched that parade put on by the residents of a small Australian town to honor the lives of American soldiers who had died there over 60 years ago. When I realized that only a handful of those presents were, present were alive for and uh, let alone remembered those events. But several generations later, there was still not just a willingness, but a sense of duty and honor in remembering our, fa our fallen. Well, it gave me a great sense of faith in the power of friendship among nations and in the enduring gifts that such friendships bring. So today, as we gather to discuss resilience and innovation in space, I'd like to offer this thought that this isn't just about shifting resources or advancing space technologies or space for space sakes, space for space sake, but it's about helping to keep the world safe. It's about maintaining space as a realm of peaceful scientific and commercial endeavor, about safeguarding the idea that our universe is open for exploration, for discovery, and for increasingly for human travel. And so that tomorrow's seven-year-olds may safely look up at the sky, the night sky, with a sense of wonder and awe. Again, I thank you uh, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, Mel, I, as I told you last night, I have a much greater appreciation 
uh, for all of our Australian friends, when I see you in the U.S., you do a lot more traveling over there than, than we do here. It's a long way to go, uh, and we really appreciate it. Thanks for being such good partners. Thanks for uh, having me here today, and I look forward to taking any questions that anybody might have. Thank you. General Raymond, sir, thank you very much for your words and your insight. Your emphasis on the importance of like-minded nations working together will have resonated heavily with this audience, um, as well as your comments on how to uh, advance more efficient capability development. Thank you also for your mention of Australia's role in transmitting the 1969 Apollo landing. Uh, for those who haven't seen it, there's a great Australian movie called The Dish, uh, which covers that event in some detail. General, uh, we've got about 15 minutes for questions as well. Um, I'll start with one. It seems that the US Space Force had only just announced when uh, announced its own, um, the establishment of US State Space Force when Hollywood launched con comedy spoofs about it. Our Space Command was announced yesterday and there are already viral videos on Star Wars and Spacemen. What's the impact of those uh, send-ups on reputation? Does it detract or is it actually good PR? You know, I, it depends. I, I, I um, had an opportunity that there was a show called Space Force that came out on Netflix. And uh, season one uh, came out a year ago. And I heard it was coming out. And there was a lot of, a lot of, I got interviewed. Every time I got interviewed, somebody would ask me about, what's my thought on the, on the Space Force show? And the guy that plays me in the Space Force show is a guy named Steve Carell. He was in the office. And I always say, my, my line to kind of get out of that, that question was, they picked the wrong actor. They should have picked Bruce Willis. And, <laughs> and so uh, right, right, before, uh, right before the show started, I got word that he wanted to talk. And so it was in the COVID. We were still under COVID. So we did a Zoom call from my office with Steve Krell. And he ca came up on the computer. And he said, the very first thing he said to me, he said, so I hear you wanted a different guy. I said, yes, sir, you got too much hair. And then I proceeded to have a really great conversation with him both humorous and non-humorous, about space. And so uh, uh, I, I think it's just a reflection that there's a lot of interest in space. Uh, it's not surprising that, uh, that uh, there would be you know, shows being done here. Uh, I think it's a good thing. And uh, we've embraced it. And um, I, I think all in all, the, the publicity has been helpful. Thanks, sir. I'll uh, read out some of the questions from the audience as well. Uh, when does territorial encroachment into space become a major source of international conflict? I think it depends. I, and I wouldn't want to speculate, it, it, or, or, uh, speculate on, it, it depends on what's going on around, in the, world, around the world. I, a lot of times I get asked about uh, space war or space deterrence. And what I say is there's, I don't think there's any such thing. I don't think there's anything such thing as a space war or, a, or space deterrence. I think it's just war, and I think it's just deterrence. And I think it depends on what's going on around the world. And you know, nations uh, have chosen uh, in, the, in history to, to fight wars, and they've fought them on the land, they fought them in the air, they fought them on the sea, and now uh, they have opportunities to fight them in, in space. So I think, I think you have to put it into the bigger context of what's going on in, on in the ground. And I wouldn't want to speculate on what may or may not be considered hostile. I think you have to look at it in the, in the broader context. Same thing with deterrence. I get asked a lot, well, how do you deter in space? Well, deterrence is just, is just fundamental calculus, deterrence calculus, uh, imposing costs and denying benefits. There's the ways to do that in the space domain. Uh, there's ways that space can help amplify that, that deterrence message. And so, again, without speculating, I think, I think it depends on the broader strategic context. Thanks, sir. You, uh, you mentioned uh, advice to Australia to be bold as well. With Australia starting our own space journey, what is it that you know now that you wish you had known when you embarked on the journey? Wow. Um, I, I, think the, I think the big, bold uh, mantra was good. Um, I think it, it's, it's served us well. We've moved out at great speed uh, to, to establish this service. Um, I think one of the things that we really wrestled with was what's the right size of the Space Force? And what we wanted, initial, the initial planning for the Space Force, for example, for the headquarters in the Pentagon was going to be 1,035 people. When I had been stationed at the Pentagon before as the Air Force A3, there was about 50 space people running around the building. I said, what is 1,035 people going to do? And so we, uh, 
we whittled that down, and we cut that down to about 600. Uh, our desire was to be, to be small and be bold and go fast. I think you have to balance that with you also operate inside of a bureaucracy, and you have to have enough mass to be able to work through and be effective in that bureaucracy. I think we probably hit it about right at 600. Uh, the first couple years as we were building to that 600, uh, uh, it was a little challenging just to be able to cover all the meetings, but I think that's one of the things you're going to have to look at. Uh, how do you position yourself to, to be innovative, which is really what the space domain requires. You've got to move at speed. Things happening in the space domain are going 17,500 miles an hour just to stay in space. You've got to be able to go fast, uh, but you've got to have enough mass behind you to get, to get, your, uh, uh, to get what you want to get done through the, through the bureaucracy. Thanks, sir. From the audience again, how important is a national approach to space power? Can you tell us how your organization works with NASA? What's in scope and what is out of scope? Yeah, I think it's really important to have a national approach. You know, there's three different sectors uh, in, the, in the U.S. space. There's uh, a national security sector. Um, there's a civil sector, I think NASA. And then there's a commercial sector. And uh, all three sectors are really alive and well. I mean, with the stand up of U.S. Space Command, the stand up of the Space Force on the national security side, with uh, the U.S. and its partners wanting to go back to the moon uh, uh, here in the near term uh, on the civil side, and then looking on to, to even further. And then uh, in the commercial side, I talked about the, the explosion of commercial space activities. And I think uh, those three things come together. Let me give you an example. A couple, I don't know what it was, let's say a year ago, I was down at the Cape watching a, a NASA launch uh, of, of astronauts back to the International Space Station from U.S. soil. So it was a NASA launch on a commercial rocket on a DOD range. So we all came together. And so I think that, that partnership and that synergy is really important. NASA is focused on science and exploration. We're focused on national security, but we operate in the same domain. We, we share, uh, we, we train together, we educate together on, on Jim Dickinson's ops floor. We, we protect and defend uh, the domain together, uh, protecting the International Space Station from, from for example, uh, uh, debris in, in space. Um, we leverage, leverage uh, some of their training tools that they had to do uh, rendezvous proximity operations, that was all done um, for NASA for, for the Apollo mission. And so what we've done is leverage the tools that they have where, the, where it makes sense, uh, where we can save some dollars and move out at speed. Uh, and, and also the, the last thing I'd say is we also work, uh, we're working on norms of behavior together. NASA and the international partners that are associated them with uh, Art, the Artemis program going back to the moon have something called the Artemis Accords. And uh, as you know, as those in this room that are working together, we also work very closely together with our partners on, on norms of behavior. And we think there's some partnerships to be had between the civil side and, and the uh, national security space side. So I would say it's very important to take that national perspective. I think that's why in the United States, the National Space Council has proven to be so valuable. It's the only place where all those sectors come together in our, in our government. Yeah, thanks, sir. I think that really resonates with our discussions over the last couple of days as well and the importance of, uh, you know, uh, military power being one element of national power and recognising industry and uh, civilian inputs into that. So in terms of personal development, do you see unique and straight sp Space Force careers or do you seek exchange with other services? Um, so when we built the Space Force, uh, we started uh, on 20 December, there was actually one person in the Space Force. That was me. Uh, the, Ar the U.S. Army had a slogan years ago, the Army of One. Well, that was no kidding. Uh, uh, that was it. Uh, what we did, though, is we took all the space folks that were in the Air Force and we assigned them to, to uh, the Space Force. And then since that time, we've transitioned those folks into the Space Force. So there's five career fields that came in, operations, intelligence, acquisition, engineering, and cyber, all critical for the space uh, domain. Uh, and we've We've gone through and we've, we've uh, sought volunteers and brought volunteers in from the Air Force to begin. And then this past year, we opened it up uh, to other services as well. Uh, we were gonna start by bringing in 50 people from other services and we had 4,000 applications for those 50 people. Uh, we upped the numbers now and we're gonna have, I think by the end of this year, uh, we'll have about 
don't quote me on this exactly, but it's around 900 or so folks that will have come in from other services, uh, uh, along with some missions that the Army did. Uh, the Army operates a payload on WGS. That those missions are going to transfer into the Space Force here really soon, now that the appropriations bill was signed. And then the Navy operates UHF satellites. They're transitioning in. I'll tell you, one of the biggest benefits we've had on standing up a service is um, the, the, the advances we've made in professional development. Uh, we think we can really do things differently, and we have more people knocking on the door wanting to come into our service than we have slots for. We only recruit officer-wise about 450 a year, and about the same number on, on, enlisted, uh, on the enlisted side. Uh, and when you only bring in those numbers, you can be really, really selective. And the, the talent that we're getting, not just in numbers, but in uh, capability, has, has really, uh, really skyrocketed. We're also looking, and I, I was fascinated yesterday, Mel, when I was talking to some of your folks. Uh, some, as I mentioned, you, I, I heard about a program where somebody in the Australian military can go work for industry for five years and then come back. We're, to get to that whole of, of nation approach to space, we're looking at the same thing. How can you take people from the Space Force, move them to industry, move them to NASA, bring them back, be much more uh, fluid? And I, I think there's a lot that we can, uh, we can learn. In fact, when we uh, were building up or, or studying how we were going to do our total force integration with the Guard, Reserve, and Active, we looked to Australia as a model on how we might do that. Uh, and so uh, I'm eager to explore more with you uh, as we progress down this path. Thanks, sir. I'm sure we'd be uh, very keen to also share lessons on the total workforce model back yeah. with you because it is yeah. something that's been quite innovative and very successful in the yeah. Australian context. Uh, sir, you approach, this links back a little bit to one of our earlier questions, but your approach to engage with industry to look at novel ways to achieve outcomes is welcomed, but will be challenged by our slow traditional acquisition processes. Have you got some more tips on how we can resolve that? Yeah, you know, I, um, I gave you the example uh, that when I went out to visit SpaceX, and that's just one company. There's other companies doing innovative things as well. If I were to give you another example and, and say that General Wilsbach is a GPS satellite floating at, orbiting at, you know, 11,000 miles above the Earth, and I wanted to buy an exact clone of General Wilsbach, that process today in our military is a five-year deal, five years. Now, juxtapose that with four months you know, designing, building a factory, and building 60 and launching them. And so we're trying as we, as we build this new force design to leverage uh, this new emerging uh, class of, of space that commercial is really pushing, proliferated low Earth orbit constellations, for example. We're trying to adopt that, adopt that business model. What I have learned, though, is you can't just attack the problem with acquisition. It starts much earlier than that. It starts with how do you design your forces. If you design your force structure to be three or four or five really exquisite, highly exquisite, highly expensive satellites, you're going to get a different answer out of the acquisition community. It's going to take you a long time to, to build it. They're exquisite capabilities. They can't fail. If it fails, you don't do a do-over. You don't get a do-over in space. You can't go up there and bring it back down and say, let's try again. And so it's got to be perfect. That, that, that drives a risk calculus and a business model that, that, that is different than one uh, that you have something coming off an assembly line uh, that if it didn't work, you got another one coming off in, in six minutes. Uh, and so the force design piece is critical. And we're really, our priority here over the next couple, uh, probably the next, but between now and the end of the, the decade, is really going to make the, to be the, to make a pivot in our structure to a more resilient by design architecture, which I think frees up our ability to use commercial to a greater extent than we've been able to today. And I think it frees up incredible opportunities with our allies and partners uh, to, as we do this, uh, to do this together to build uh, complementary systems that, uh, that add uh, to this capability and, and, and add to deterrence. I think the other piece of this is the requirements work that I talked about. So after you build the design, you have to turn it into requirements. Um, we're trying to change the way we do requirements as well and doing them in a, on a digital basis uh, uh, and doing it in partnership and in collaboration much earlier with an industry. I don't know how many friends of mine, and Joan North, sir, it's good to see you here, uh, have come up to me and said, Jay, you do not understand how much time or dollars industry spends trying to figure out what's in your head. And I said, well, <laughs> that's pretty sad because I'll just tell them. And they don't have to figure out, a, they don't have to spend a dime or, or a day. I want them to spend a dime on capability. 
And so we really want to have this dialogue early and make sure that we've got, uh, got their best and brightest helping us think through this and getting it right. Sarah, I think we have time for one final question. And uh, there's a question from the floor. Can you please explain the relationship between the United States Space Force, the COCOM, and the NRO? I sure will. It, it, it can be confusing. And I would throw in there, I, I, I'll throw in there NASA as well. I addressed that a little bit. When, when the average American thinks of space, they think of NASA. That's the thing that's visible. That's, you know, they watch uh, Man Walk on the Moon. That's kind of been the public face. A lot of folks don't realize the military has been involved in space since the beginning, since the 50s. Uh, but NASA, science and exploration. In the Department of Defense, there was a law, there was a law in our nation called the Goldwater-Nichols Act that was established in the 80s. Uh, and that law said there's kind of two different functions in the department. One function is, is organize, train, and equip. That's what services do. Think Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, uh, and now the Space Force. And then the other one is a warfighting function. Uh, and operating under the authorities of those combatant commands. So there's 11 combatant commands in our nation, Indo-PACOM, uh, UCOM, Central Command, U.S. Strategic Command, Cyber Command. There's a mixture of uh, geographic and functional combatant commands. And so the Space Force is a service that organizes, trains, and equips and operates those capabilities and provides those capabilities to General Dickinson and other combatant commanders around the globe for them to conduct operations each and every day. And so that's that relationship. It's normalized relationship, just like PACAF in Indo-PACOM. Uh, it's a service uh, relationship vice, uh, vice a, uh, uh, a combatant commander. And then the National Reconnaissance Office is another great partner with us. They're an intel organization. Uh, they, they, um, we, we partner very, very closely with them. We, there's about 800 guardians that, are, that are, uh, operate or assigned to the National Reconnaissance Office. Um, their, their mission set is focused on intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. Our mission set is focused on missile warning communications, uh, GPS, space situational awareness. So it's a different mission set, uh, uh, but with, with great ties between the two of us. Sir, I think unfortunately that's all time, well, we have time for. I know the audience would probably appreciate about another uh, hour of Q&A, but uh, in order to enable the next plenary session to commence, ladies and gentlemen, can you please join me in thanking General Raymond for his presentation.